The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 2223 in the name of Claire Adamson on type 1 diabetes in Scotland. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those who wish to speak in the debate to request, sorry, to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Claire Adamson to open the debate. Around seven minutes, please, Ms Adamson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I begin by thanking my colleagues across the Chamber for supporting the motion on type 1 diabetes in Scotland, allowing this debate to happen this evening. Uh, I would also like to welcome to the gallery some of the Juvenile Diabetes Research Fund members, uh, GDIF representatives, and also uh, members of the type 1 diabetes family, family community in Scotland. This debate is to raise awareness of type 1 diabetes a condition that affects 29,000 people living in Scotland. And Scotland has the third highest incidence of type 1 diabetes in the world. I'm by no means an expert on this disease and my relationship with GDRF began when I was invited to the wonderful Strathclyde Park in my constituency to open the GDRF One Walk campaign uh, fundraising event this year and met with many of the families at that event, uh, an event that raised over £70,000 for type 1 diabetes research. And I have to commend the families and those who support people with type 1 diabetes. It is an extremely um, profound diagnosis to have in your family. For young children, it can mean disruption to sleeping patterns, to education, um, with constant monitoring required to ensure um, an, a, a glucose balance within the body. And, and um, I, I was further very pleased to be able to meet with some of the families at an event held by my colleague Anna Sarwar by GDRF in the Parliament. And I'd like to commend the families again who were represented there, who um, were um, included Ruth Elliott, whose young son Ben was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at 18 months old. And Ruth has raised over £23,500 for JDRF by climbing Kilimanjaro and taking part in other fundraising events. I'd also like to, to commend David Ballantyne, who I believe it was his granddaughter who has a type 1 diagnosi diagnosis. And he made uh, headlines last year when he hauled a 19-stone anvil up Arran Peak in Goldfell over a 26-day um, excursion, a Herculean effort um, that raised £15,400. And um, I, I really do have to commend um, the community for getting behind and supporting those who suffer with this disease. But I'd also specifically mention Anne, Anna Ferrar, who, when she visited the Parliament, I'm sure was having a day off school, it might even have been off nursery, <laughs> um, who came along and was able to demonstrate the continuous glucose monitoring system that she has, but she reads with a mobile phone and helps her manage her diabetes, and that's something that her family have to fundraise for on an ongoing basis to, to fund that, that control of her um, disease. I'd like to set the tone by uh, mentioning um, a quote from Peter Jones, who's the chair of JDRF Scotland, who said he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when he was 37. And the impact it had will continue to have on his life is profound. It's not linked to lifestyle and there is no known cure. Managing the condition on a day-to-day -day basis is like walking a tightrope. We have the expertise to accelerate the path towards discovery of new treatments and one day, a cure. If we can encourage Scotland to lead the global fight against type 1 diabetes, we should be doing this. And I think that kind of sets the tone about what I wanted to, to bring to the Chamber and to share with my colleagues and share with the wider um, community in Scotland about the work that JDRF do. JDRF have three research streams. One is, is specifically in finding a cure for those currently suffering, which would involve um, some system that would replace um, the molecules that are lost within the pancreas, attacked by the immune system, causing the type 1 diabetes. They also have a treatment research stream, um, which is looking uh, most specifically at the development of an artificial pancreas, which would be a, a replacement for the body's own function, its pancreatic function, and um, can be able to provide insulin levels and monitor glucose levels within the body automatically. And they're also looking at smart insulins, which um, could be injected at any time by type 1 diabetic, but would only become active within the body when the glucose levels required that. Um, so it's a very, very innovative research work. 
And also they are looking at the prevention research stream, which is actually understanding the genetics and the immune system further to actually prevent the immune system fault that leads to the development of type 1 diabetes within the, the body. Presiding officer, Scotland is home to some of the world's best type 1 diabetes research. Scotland-based researchers in Dundee, Edinburgh and Glasgow received funding in the region of £3.9 million, £3 million from JDRF every year. And the Scottish Government's Chief Scientist Office co-funds Scottish Diabetics Research Network Type 1 bioresource, which contains samples of blood, urine and DNA over, of over 6,100 Type 1 diabetes patients in Scotland. This is a unique and fantastic resource, coupled with the Scotland's world-reading and award-winning SCI diabetes system, which provides comprehensive snapshot of diabetes in Scotland and is the envy of others across the globe. Data on SCI diabetes can also be viewed by GP practices, by hospitals, and patients can view their own data to support the self-management of their condition. The D-based Scottish Care Information Diabetes was com is commissioned and owned by the Scottish Government and is providing a fully integrated shared electronic patient record to support the treatment of NHS Scotland patients with diabetes. JDRF themselves say this is the jewel in the crown of Scotland's arsenal to fight diabetes and it has been successfully exported to the Middle East. It provides functionality for both primary and secondary care clinicians and includes special modules for paediatrics, podiatry, diabetes and special nursing dietetics. Can I say um, one of the things that I did learn when I met with the, the, the patients is that they sometimes get very frustrated that type 1 diabetes is linked with type 2 diabetes and at the time of the walk that I was there they were particularly concerned about food standards agency campaign that had been run which didn't initially make the distinction between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Can I say that um, uh, to the families that I met on that day and to the families that are here today that to the best of my ability I have addressed this with the food standards agency and uh, I want to thank their chair Ross Finney and chief executive Jeff Ogilvy who met with me in a very productive and open and helpful meeting um, and I'm sure that the concerns of the type 1 community are very well understood at this time. I'd like to finish by just again thanking my colleagues this evening for the opportunity to raise the concerns and the, the, um, the challenges faced by the type 1 diabetic community and I'm looking forward to the debate going forward. Thank you. Um, move on to the open speeches. Speeches of up to four minutes, please. Alex Rowley to be followed by Miles Briggs. Uh, presiding officer, can I begin by congratulating Claire Adams for bringing forward this member's debate on type 1 diabetes. I hope we can agree a consensus across the chamber to raise awareness of the condition and the work that is needed to drive forward research into a cure. I wish also to commend the work of GDRF as their passion and dedication into research and campaigning for finding a cure for type 1 diabetes is exceptional. I am also grateful for the comprehensive briefing provided by GDRF and in particular the way they have set out the issues they wish to see as the basis for continuing discussion within this parliament with a focus on excellence in research and collaboration across Northern Europe. Last September, I attended a meeting hosted by Anna Sarwar, where families affected by type 1 diabetes called on MSPs to raise awareness of the condition and to put Scotland at the forefront of type 1 diabetes research. It is very valuable for politicians to hear testimonies of what the condition is actually like for those who have to live with it. I welcome the research that has been undertaken by JDRF into curing, treating and preventing the condition. I also hope that this work will help us understand why instances of the condition are rapidly rising in children under the age of five in Scotland. The approach taken to foster collaboration between industry, academics and clinicians is a welcome approach. 
and I hope that this proves successful in producing results that can improve the condition of those living with type 1 diabetes. JDRF has shown that it wants to work with parliamentarians to target investment in type 1 diabetes research, reduce bureaucracy that hinders that research and improve the delivery of the research findings. I hope that we can agree across the Chamber to work with JDRF on these aims. I welcome the additional funding of £10 million by the Scottish Government to fund more insulin pumps and, and continuous glucose monitoring equipment. This is a step in the right direction. However, we must continue to strive further in the improvement of type 1 research and treatment. I hope that the Scottish Government will commit to safeguarding and fully funding the Scottish Care Information Diabetes Database, which JDRF describe as the jewel in the crown of Scotland's arsenal to fight diabetes. JDRF have also shown interest in a northern European area of excellence we share a mutual interest with various Scandinavian countries, Finland, Sweden, Norway, Denmark and Scotland, each of whom are amongst the 10 highest countries in the world for type 1 instances in children. There is an opportunity to enter discussions with these countries on shared interests when it comes to research. It is clear from this dedicated campaigning work undertaken by JDRF that there is a three-way approach to dealing with type 1 diabetes. There must be understanding, management and treatment of the condition. This parliament and all parliamentarians can take steps to help progress this. This debate alone is essential in raising awareness, particularly considering the fact that Scotland does have the third highest incidence of type 1 diabetes in the world. This will help generate further understanding of the condition and hopefully will lead to further discussion on the management and treatment of type 1 diabetes. I hope that we can continue to work together to support world-leading research happening here in Scotland and with the political will alongside the leading industry, academia and the work of clinicians that we can eventually find and deliver a cure for type 1 diabetes. Thank you. Miles Briggs and then Graham Day. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by congratulating Claire Adamson on securing today's debate and also to congratulate her for the work that she's undertaken both inside and outside of Parliament. I also would like to thank Diabetes Scotland and JDRF for their useful briefings ahead of this evening's debate. As the motion makes clear, type 1 diabetes, unlike type 2, is not linked to dietary or lifestyle, lifestyle factors. Rather, it's an autoimmune moon condition whose cause is not yet understood and which is unpreventable at the present time. I have a good friend who has type 1 diabetes. Her and has had it for her whole life. And I have to say that I've always been amazed, and, and it's always amazed me, how she's never let that hold her back in anything that she has turned her hand to. But growing up and working with her, I was always concerned at the constant strain which the monitoring of her blood glucose levels has on her body, as well as the injecting of insulin, which she has to undertake, and the effect that this has in her life, perhaps especially when she was a young woman growing up. As has always already been mentioned, blood glucose levels must be monitored up to 10 times a day. So the development and rollout of continuous glucose monitoring, an area which Scotland has lagged behind in recent years, will be of real benefit to type 1 diabetes patients. The Scottish Government's recent announcement of £10 million is indeed welcome, although we need to see more detail surrounding how this will be rolled out and the timescale for doing so, so that the many thousands of Scottish patients who desperately need CGM can access it without further delay. And I hope this is something the Minister will outline when responding to this evening's debate. I'd also like to join Claire Adamson in paying tribute to JDRF for the excellent work they do, both in supporting people who have type 1 diabetes and in funding the research to prevent the disease, improve current treatments, and eventually, let's hope, to find a cure. With Scotland, as already been outlined today, having such a high incidence of type 1 diabetes, it's entirely appropriate that our scientists are at the front, forefront of this vital research. 
As the motion suggests, some internationally important research is currently being undertaken in Scotland with the, su with the support of funding from JDRF. For example, at the University of Edinburgh in my region, Professor Helen Cohen and her team are working on a project to develop a set of indicators of the disease or biomarkers to be used along with clinical data to find out who is at most risk of rapid progression of diabetic kidney disease. They aim to produce useful information that will help accelerate the process of developing drugs to prevent and reverse kidney disease in type 1. And I wish these researchers and others working in this area all the very best of success. We must also ensure that our NHS is providing the best possible service and support to type 1 patients. Diabetes UK's 2015 The Age of Diabetes report highlighted a range of areas where improvements are clearly required in Scotland. And it's a real, of real concern, I think, to everyone in the chamber that the evidence now suggests that people with type 1 diabetes are receiving a poorer level of care than those with type 2, with the percentage of type 1 patients receiving their vital HbA1c check each year being lower than the number of people with type 2. This must be addressed to help reduce the risk of potential complications as, as a result of people not being supported to manage their diabetes well. And so I hope this is also an area we can look at um, making changes in the future. Deputy Presiding Officer, diabetes is rightly high on the public health agenda and it must remain so. And, and tackling the rise in the number of people with type 2 is clearly a policy priority for governments across the Western world. But we must also recognise the needs of our constituents who have type 1 diabetes and ensure that they are getting the best possible treatment, support and care until hopefully our scientists can develop the cure that we all want to see. Thank you. I call Graham Day to be followed by David Stewart. Uh, thank you. Uh, President Officer, can I firstly congratulate Claire Adamson on securing this debate on a very important issue which touches the lives of and impacts upon so many, especially here in Scotland, where more than 6,000 families are known to be affected. Uh, at the beginning of December, I attended an event at Dynamic Earth to celebrate the 30th anniversary of JDRF. I, I did so to support my constituents, Helen and Malcolm Taylor, who in 2012 tragically and needlessly lost their teenage daughter, Claire, to undiagnosed type 1 diabetes. The Taylors, in seeking to ensure some small good emerged from a tragedy which has impacted the lives of all the family, have organised events to fundraise for JDRF and raise awareness of type 1 diabetes. Let me take this opportunity to express my admiration for the way in which Helen and Malcolm have gone about that and indeed conducted themselves, especially given the specific circumstances around Claire's passing. Can I also note how struck I was by two contributions made to the 30th anniversary event at Dynamic Earth. The first was from the First Minister, who has very clearly maintained a passion for tackling type 1 diabetes from her days as Health Secretary. The second came from a 12-year-old type 1 diabetes sufferer called Katie Shaw, who captivated the audience as she explained how research has helped her and her younger sister. I came away from Dynamic Earth genuinely uplifted because what we'd heard all round was a story of progress and hope, and a story firmly rooted in Tayside. As Claire Adamson's motion mentions, JDRF is funding research into type 1 diabetes at the University of Dundee, as is the Scottish Government. The main project is initially receiving £1.7 million pounds from the, uh, dollars rather, from the charity. The scientists involved in this project are conducting the biggest study of its kind in Europe. They are looking at a new hypothesis that an, an inexpensive drug with a simple treatment regimen uh, can prevent type 1 diabetes. The study aims to contact all 6,400 families in Scotland affected by the condition with a view to expanding into England at a later date. Children aged 5 to 16 who have a sibling or parent with type 1 diabetes will be invited for a blood test to establish whether they are at high risk of developing the disease. The disease if so, they will be asked to take part in the trial. Researchers will then examine the impact of administering metformin, and metformin, the world's most commonly prescribed diabetes medicine, to young people in the high-risk category. If, if successful, the, uh, the large-scale trial could exp uh, uh, explain why the incidence of type 1 diabetes has risen five-fold in the last 40 years and provide a means of preventing it. Another area where Dundee is at the forefront of attack on diabetes is the SCI diabetes system, which is based in the city. GDRF, uh, as we've heard, cites this as the jewel in the crown of Scotland's arsenal to fight 
uh, type 1. SCI uh, Diabetes provides a fully integrated share electronic uh, patient record to support treatment uh, of NHS Scotland patients. With the right safeguards in place, it could also be a great tool for researchers studying patterns in type 1 or looking to recruit people to trials. Presiding officer, although there is much to be optimistic about in terms of getting to the root cause of type 1 diabetes and finding a cure, we're not there yet. And as long as there is no cure, we must do what we can to make the lives of those with diabetes easier. That's why I so warmly welcome the recent announcement of £10 million of funding from the Scottish Government for insulin pumps and continuous glucose monitoring equipment. There are now 3,200 insulin pumps in use in Scotland, an increase of 400% since 2010 thanks to 7.5 million in previous funding from this government. The new tranche of funding will build upon that over the next five years, helping people to better manage their diabetes. Beyond that, JDRF states that one day there will be uh, a world without type one diabetes. And presiding officer, on those positive and hopeful notes, I'll conclude. David Stewart to be followed by Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and could I also congratulate uh, Claire Armstrong on securing this evening's debate and for her very clear and indeed passionate speech uh, on type 1 diabetes. Presiding Officer, I should declare an interest of sorts um, as the long-standing joint convener of the cross-party group on diabetes and as the first Scottish parliamentary champion. I want to put on record my thanks for all the groups in Scotland who work with people with diabetes, JDRF, Diabetes Scotland, the scientists, researchers, and of course the dedicated doctors, carers, consultants, and diabetic nurses. But beside an officer, we should not forget the proud record from history, where a Scot, Professor John MacLeod, along with Banting and Best, discovered insulin in 1921 and received a Nobel Prize in medicine. Before 1921, having type 1 diabetes was a death sentence. My own late father-in-law was diagnosed at the age of 10 and he was told he would live only until he was 20. In fact, he lived another 65 years. And he taught me that with a well-regulated pen needle injections and diet, you could live a normal and balanced life. So what is the big picture? Well, the prevalence of the condition has doubled since 2003. It is the main cause of blindness in those of working age, and 10% of NHS hospital expenditure relates to the treatment of diabetes and its complication and 40% of people living with type 1 has some form of diabetic retinopathy. Now, Claire Addison's motion rightly focuses on research. We have a huge acute challenge, but also unparalleled opportunities to improve the lives of people in Scotland with the condition. We should also aspire, in my view, to be the world leader in type 1 research and development. Scotland has real strength in life science and the biotech sectors, we have a real comparative advantage that we should exploit. Let me give you one example of best practice and collaboration from my own region in the Highlands and Islands. Collaboration with business, with the public agencies and the university sector, the so-called triple helix. Uh, Johnson & Johnston acquired the UK assets of Inverness Medical Limited, which was originally established in Inverness to design and manufacture glucose test strips and electronic meters for the global diabetic market. This site employs over a thousand people and is regarded as a centre of excellence for those working in the field of diabetes. Hans and I's enterprise played a major role in attracting Johnson & Johnson to the Highlands, which reinforces my view of the importance of a locally based enterprise agency. It is part of the Highland Diabetes Institute, which is a unique model uh, bringing together a partnership between a commercial company, an academic institution, in the case of UHI, and a national health provider. Presiding officer, just a few short months ago, I took part in a JDRF roundtable dinner to debate type 1 research. The participants were leaders in the field in science, in medicine, and biotechnology. The clear conclusion was that with 800 to 900 new type 1s in Scotland every year, there needs to be major strides made in biobanking, uh, the jargon for the process of obtaining samples of tissues for research use. Now, first-class work has already been carried out. Some previous speakers have mentioned the Scottish Diabetes Research Network Type 1 bioresource. This is a phenomenal resource, but we need to, a rigorous strategy to protect, grow and nurture the next generation of world-class researchers in Scotland. 
So in conclusion, Mr. Iden, officer, could I thank Claire Armstrong again for her initiative in securing this debate. In the 1920s, a Scot made a revolutionary step change with the discovery of insulin. Our goal for 2020 must be to foster world-class research to prevent, to treat and to cure type 1 diabetes. Ryan Whittle to be followed by Emma Harper. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I also begin by thanking Claire Anderson for bringing this important debate to the Chamber. Now, I sit on the cross-party group for diabetes, and although my uh, initial area of interest was uh, type 2 diabetes and its prevention, I'm fast catching up with the details of type 1 diabetes, the difficulties living with the disease can bring, the fast pace of developing technology that can bring relief to sufferers, and the incredible work being done by GDRF and others in the search for, to find a cure. Now, the daughter of a friend of mine uh, was diagnosed with the condition a decade ago at the age of four. As a parent, how do you explain to a four-year-old that she has to have injections every day? My, my friend gave himself a placebo, in, a placebo injection at the same time as his daughter's injection to help her through that. Anything you can do to be a parent. So a cure cannot come fast enough. Now, it's been a steep learning curve for me on the cross-party group with my colleague, uh, group convener and very patient teacher, Emma Harper, uh, leading my education. And Ms Harper can speak from personal experience and has a much uh, deeper knowledge and understanding of the disease and speaks much more eloquently and in depth on the subject than I can. But I actually coach an athlete who has type 1 diabetes and he goes through the routine of testing his blood sugar at the start of every training session to ensure that he is at the correct level for intense uh, physical activity. And I think this speaks to a very important point. In most cases, with careful monitoring and healthy diet, having type 1 diabetes diagnosis does not prevent a person from continuing with a full, active and inclusive lifestyle. This particular athlete, for example, has in fact medaled at the Scottish Championship. And let's face it, you can be diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and still become Prime Minister. However, what has become clear to me is that there is an uneven spread of access to information, to advice, education and certain types of treatment, especially developing, te developing technologies like insulin pumps and constant glucose monitoring. This in inequality in turn inevitably leads to inequality of opportunity and inequality in leading a more fulfilling, inclusive and productive life. We in the cross-party group have held compelling testaments to the difference that an insulin pump can make to the lifestyle and therefore the well-being of a type 1 diabetes sufferer. I can remember a specific talk given in, given in the last cross-party group by a young lady had intense struggles with the condition, the blackouts, hypoglycemia, a year lost at university, the constant mental pressure of not knowing when the next collapse might happen. Having been fitted with that insulin pump, despite her initial reservations, has transformed her life. She now lives a normal, fulfilling life and has even learned to drive, something she thought would be far beyond her reach. So while the search for a cure continues, the challenge for tackling type 1 diabetes is twofold. Number one, education is key to ensuring that all have access to the information they require to understand the condition and have access to the innovations and management systems that allow for normal living. And secondly, there is a constant financial battle within the health service to allocate appropriate funding to the treatment of all diseases and conditions, as well as the research into the development of more effective treatments and ultimately cures. It's an increasing juggling act to ensure that all bases are covered and some of the covers in those bases that are ine inevitably becoming rather thin. What we must do is not consider conditions in isolation. For example, if we were able to reverse the rise of type 2 diabetes and the sub subsequent increasing drain on the NHS resources, which is some 12% of the NHS overall spend, some of that savings and the savings from other preventable diseases like obesity and alcoholism, uh, drug addiction, smoking, musculoskeletal conditions, strokes and heart disease could be reallocated to the treatment of type 1 diabetes and the research into finding a cure. A reallocation of precious resource that could ensure that the access to effective treatments of type 1 diabetes need not be a postcode lottery. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, I warmly welcome the chance to discuss type 1 diabetes in Scotland to commend our NHF, the NHS staff and their commitment to deliver the very best in care and treatment to sufferers and to highlight the fantastic research work that GD, GDRF and others organisations are doing to treat and ultimately cure this potentially debilitating condition. Thank you. Microphone would help, wouldn't it? 
Emma Harper to be followed by Anna Sarmer. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to add my congratulations also to Claire Adamson for securing this debate. I've actually really enjoyed it so far. I'd like to also bring members' attention to my interest as a co-convener of the cross-party group with Dave Stewart on diabetes. Um, understanding how serious type 1 diabetes is, is knowing that in Scotland we've got 30,000 people who have diabetes, uh, 2,517 adults and about 3,812 children. Type 1 diabetes is not caused by lifestyle and there is currently no way to prevent the condition. The long-term implications of the disease are well documented. They include many complications, an increased risk of dying from heart disease and stroke, both of which are clinical priorities in Scotland, and there are microvascular complications that can affect the eyes, the heart, kidneys, extremities, and even the gastrointestinal system. Diabetes complications have a major economic impact on the NHS. One billion pounds per year, or 10% of the NHS budget is spent on diabetes and its complications. What more people may not be aware of are the short-term complications, the day-to-day -day living with type 1 diabetes. Persons with type 1 must continuously monitor their glucose levels day and even night to ensure that blood glucose levels are correct. Blood glucose levels that are too low can lead to hypoglycemia and even seizure activity and loss of consciousness. Levels which are too high can send patients into hyperglycemia, which can also be life-threatening. Therefore, unsurprisingly, living with type 1 can disrupt one's life on a daily, sometimes hourly basis. It is incredibly important to me, as co-convener of the cross-party group, to use that platform to explore what can be done to help those who live with diabetes. Helping families with diabetic children manage the disease is something I'm particularly passionate about, as I saw during my time as a nurse and how difficult it can be when you're listening to parents tell the stories of their daily life and the behaviours they have to adapt to. It's especially difficult for the parents of children who don't know the symptoms of hypoglycemia and they're not aware of the symptoms and therefore they need to be monitored really closely through the night. I'd like to emphasise this. Some parents wake their kids three times during the night to do a finger stick for a blood glucose sample. And being unaware of low blood sugar, you know, it can have its real difficulties, as I've talked about. So waking your children to check their blood glucose levels is exhausting for all those involved. A child diagnosed with type 1 at the age of 5 can face up to 19,000 injections and 50,000 finger sticks by the time that they're 18. And that can be five or more finger sticks a day. And the Junior Diabetic Research Fund is an excellent charity working to give a voice to these children and their families and drive forward research until we find a cure. The research is crucial. I remember in 1978 testing my urine for the presence of sugar, and now we've come a long way. The charity was founded by some of the world leading research doctors, and it's happening in Dundee, Edinburgh, Glasgow, and there's some great funding that has been added to it, three, about 3.9 million. A big step we can take and what we are taking to make the lives of persons with type 1 easier is to develop and help fund the new and innovative methods of meeting the challenge of continually monitoring glucose levels. For example, we have continuous glucose monitoring and we have wee gizmos like I have got one, flash monitoring which allows greater scrutiny of blood glucose levels allowing young people to lead independent lives, doing things their peers take for granted, like travelling to uni on public transport, or obtaining a driver's licence, or even a job. Last year, a new plan to improve the management of type 1 diabetes was backed by £10 million of investment by the Scottish Government. So I thank Claire again for bringing forward this debate, and I'm confident that Scotland can continue to lead the way in both development and implementation implementation of technology to help those with type 1 diabetes and find a cure. Thank you very much. Uh, the last of the open speeches, Anna Sarver. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I join other uh, colleagues in congratulating Claire Adamson for bringing forward uh, this debate and also genuinely thank her for her compassionate and passionate way that she has supported this issue. Um, she joined me at that uh, cross-party uh, meeting that we had with JDRF um, and her contribution, the contributions we heard particularly from the young families I thought was extraordinary and moving 
Um, and she mentioned young Anna, who I think touched all of us on that day. Uh, we thought the politicians were centre of attention, but I can assure you that young Anna was centre of attention uh, that day. Uh, can I also pay tribute to the JDRF, who are the leading global charity uh, on this important issue, who are leading research uh, that will benefit not just Scotland, but actually benefits people right across uh, the world. So thank you to the JDRF for their uh, hard work and dedication on this very, very important issue. Other colleagues have already mentioned some of the statistics, but I just want to run through some of them again really quickly. Scotland has the third highest incidence of type 1 diabetes in the world. More than 29,000 people in Scotland live with the condition. And as Alec Rowley said, it's increasing at a rate of 4% each year, particularly in children under five. At the same time, through Scottish-based research, we have £3.9 million in research coming from the JDRF. And there's research projects based in Glasgow Edinburgh and Dundee, which are looking at complications and treatments of type 1 um, diabetes. I want to focus my remarks today, Deputy President Officer, on uh, how we can improve matters in Scotland and some key asks uh, to, to government and indeed key asks to all political parties. What is it that drives people that suffer from type 1 diabetes? It's the hope of a cure, and we got that sense very clearly from the families um, at our uh, meeting. Um, and that's why the 19 research and university and higher education institutions that are playing their part collaboratively between industry, between academia and clinicians is recognised worldwide. Scotland can be the global leader on type 1 diabetes. And I think that's something that we can take pride in right across this chamber. If we in Scotland could find that global cure to type 1 diabetes. Um, so in terms of some of the asks, I welcome and congratulate the Scottish Government via the Chief Scientist Office who have pledge £1 million annually to uh, research of type 1 diabetes. Uh, I wonder from the government if there's a plan to expand uh, the level of funding towards research as we uh, progress over coming years. Uh, secondly, there are the GDRF working closely with, again, the Chief Scientist Office to develop the research fellowships uh, in Scotland. Um, is this something that the Scottish Government too will be committed to in terms of supporting uh, the fellowships so we can widen the research aimed at prevention, treatment and a cure? for type 1 diabetes. And importantly, there is so much important research happening in Scotland. Can we have a commitment that research will not just be published and recognised, but also demonstrated in terms of the actions that we take here in Scotland to try and widen um, access, to try and widen the use of pumps, also CGMs, uh, and also to share that knowledge and best practice with other parts of the UK and indeed other parts of the world uh, too. One of the overarching messages we got from our meeting was from uh, people saying we need public awareness to stop the confusion of type 1 diabetes and of type 2 diabetes. I hope we played our part today in trying to create that awareness, but how we can create awareness uh, more generally in the public, I, I think would also be uh, helpful. Uh, the availability of insulin pumps, we've heard about the expansion of the availability of pumps and extra funding, which is to be welcomed. Um, what level will that be uh, rolled out at across all all parts of Scotland. We don't know the details yet in terms of individual health boards to make sure we don't have any kind of postcode lottery between health boards so that we can have a, a uniformity of access to insulin pumps right across um, Scotland. And also in terms of the continuous glucose monitoring, how we can accelerate the delivery of that and again have it uniform right across all parts um, of Scotland. And finally, as someone who employed an individual with type 1 diabetes, I don't think we recognise the impact that type 1 diabetes can have on an individual, whether they be at school, in a college, in a university, or indeed in the workplace. And I think more work can be done to make sure we're educating employers and educators about how they can support people with type 1 diabetes in a much more meaningful uh, way. And I end by just saying, I genuinely hope that uh, in Scotland we can find that cure and be a beacon of hope for the rest of the world. I now call Aileen Campbell to, to wind up this debate. Uh, around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank, sorry, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, and I also, like others, thank Claire Adamson for today's uh, debate and also welcome the JDRF uh, and others impacted upon type 1 diabetes to the Chamber uh, this evening and congratulate the efforts described by Claire to raise so much, um, whether that's at Strathclyde Park, up Kilimanjaro or hauling an anvil up Goat Fell, I think she described. Um, the Scottish Government recognises the challenges faced by people living with all forms of diabetes on a daily basis. 
But today's debate has focused rightly on type 1 diabetes, and I believe that Scotland does have a strong track record on helping people with type 1 diabetes live longer, healthier lives. The Scottish Government does not, however, act alone or have all the answers. The cause for type 1 diabetes is not known, it is not linked to lifestyle factors, and at the moment there is no cure. 80% of diabetes complications are preventable or can be delayed with early detection, good care and self-management. And I think that's what makes Graham Day's uh, contribution so prof profound. And I too pass, uh, pay tribute to his constituents, Helen and Malcolm, following the tragic loss of their daughter, Claire. And I think this shows that, that we must do more to make sure that we can make uh, improvements across uh, Scotland. Our di Scottish Diabetes Survey, though, is uh, informed by Sky Diabetes, probably the most complete di diabetes register in the world. We know from the survey that there are now over 30,000 people living with type 1 diabetes in Scotland. And the survey is an incredibly important tool in helping us to achieve improvement and enable us to see and monitor changes over time. It shows us that while the numbers of people with type 1 diabetes are increasing, the rate of increase has remained relatively static. Within the under five-year-olds group, the picture is similar. And this is why research is so important. Uh, JIDRF's work is hugely valu valuable, as Claire Adamson, Anna Sarward and others have right re rightly reflected. Through their research, which includes investment of almost £4 million at Dundee, Edinburgh and Glasgow, their support and their advocacy services, this is valuable not just to government but to society as a whole. And in 2015, the Scottish Government published the Health and Social Care Research Strategy, delivering innovation through research. And this sets out an ambitious agenda for change. It required new ways of working and identified four areas critical to our future success. They are efficient support for research, partnership and Scottish patient and public, eh, targeted deployment of resources and investing in the future. In this context, the Chief Scientist Office eh, of the Scottish Government invests over 60 million each year to support the health research infrastructure, to buy into UK-wide funding programmes and to directly fund research studies, primarily through its two response mode committees. And in order to improve our understanding of the impact of changing diabetes care on our population, the complications associated with diabetes and the development of new therapies, the CSO also funds the Scottish Diabetes Research Network. And that network supports the setup and the delivery of clinical and epidemiological research across Scotland. And recent studies have included a range of commercial trials of novel therapies for people with diabetes, a groundbreaking multi-centre trial of insulin pump therapy, and rates of amputation in people with diabetes. Scotland can also draw on a series of unique research assets to support research in diabetes, including Sky Diabetes, which tracks real-time clinical information on all people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes in Scotland. It's used in all hospital clinics and 1,200 GP practices, and it has been successfully employed to recruit to clinical studies. And with the Scottish Diabetes Research Register, over 10,000 patients have consented to be part of an electronic database of patients who have agreed to be contacted about research for which they are eligible. And this research register uses the latest clinical data on each patient to identify suitable patients for studies, thereby increasing the efficiency of recruitment to clinical trials. So many treatments for diabetes are delivered in primary care and primary care professionals have a key role to play in achieving the aim of diabetes research and maximising access to clinical studies for diabetes patients in Scotland. Implementation of the Diabetes Research Network Primary Care Initiative aims to expand the number of studies that can be carried out in primary care by engaging and providing support to GP practices to conduct clinical trials. So indeed, this uh, initiative recently won the Primary Care Award for Innovation in Service Delivery at a Diabetes UK Professional Conference. But specifically in relation to Type 1 diabetes, the Scottish Government is also proud to have been involved in setting up of the Type 1 Diabetes Bioresource, which is co-funded by the Chief Scientist Office and Diabetes UK. Over 6,000 Type 1 patients have consented to take part in the study, thereby creating the largest biobank of Type 1 diabetes adults in Europe with blood, urine and DNA available for further study. This resource is well placed to enable exciting new discoveries on the cause and the treatment of Type 1 diabetes. So in summary, Scotland can be proud of the strong body of research into diabetes, which we both lead and host, but we are not complacent and together must rise to the challenge posed by such a serious disease which impacts on the lives of thousands of people in Scotland. 
and the impacts of which have been articulated by many MSPs here tonight. Alex Rowley, I think, is right. The power of people's testimonies is important to ensure that we continue to make the improvements we need. Miles Briggs and Brian Whittle are also right to acknowledge the impact this uh, uh, type 1 di diabetes has on young people in particular. And of course, Emma, Harper, uh, co Emma Harper's contribution and in-depth knowledge is particularly compelling. So too, the authoritative way in which she spoke uh, this evening. And whilst we nationally and internationally strive to find a cure for diabetes here in Scotland, we do continue to work hard to ensure that people are supported by world-class diabetes services. Through our Di Diabetes Improvement Plan, we're progressing a wide range of actions to achieve this. Some examples include uh, the Diabetic Ketoacidosis uh, Campaign, run for two consecutive years, which aims to raise awareness of signs, symptoms to prompt quick, quick referral and early diagnosis. The National Glycemic Target Campaign, know the numbers for children and for adults to help people understand the blood glucose reading they should be aiming for. And structured education resources for people newly diagnosed with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And whilst that is only a small flavour of some of the activity, I do want to talk a little more detail about three important areas in particular. The First Minister, as others have highlighted this evening, announced £10 million of new funding at the JDRF's 30th anniversary. This funding uh, will support further increase in provision of insulin pumps for adults and also improve access to continuous glucose monitors. And we know that for some people, these technologies can literally be life changing. At the start of 2016, we introduced a new quarterly reporting me mechanism, which enables diabetes teams to monitor and identify improvement across 12 key measures of diabetes care. And these measures include the nine essential healthcare checks, which are so important in keeping healthy and reducing risk and detecting signs of the complications that are associated with diabetes. And access to information to support people to self-manage their diabetes is equally as important. And My Diabetes My Way is an award-winning resource that enables people to see and check their clinical results and their health information. And it provides a wide range of advice and is demonstrating its value in helping people who use it to improve their blood glucose control. And to further help raise awareness of living well with diabetes, from next month we'll also be running a, a campaign, a poster campaign in community pharmacies to encourage people to make sure that they get all of their nine healthcare checks. So to conclude, uh, Presiding Officer, uh, I want to place our thanks to the incredibly valuable work of Diabetes Scotland in supporting people that live with diabetes, and of course to the dedication and the efforts and the research of the JDRF. Uh, I would also like to offer my thanks to Claire Adamson and the other members this evening for the contributions they've made for tonight's debate. David Stewart reminded us that Scotland led the way in the discovery of insulin treatment in 1921. We should, though, aspire to continue to lead and build on the strengths that I have and others have outlined today, because we are all united in a desire to help people living with diabetes live longer and healthier lives and support the work of JDRF and others to find that long yearned for cure for type 1 diabetes. So thank you. This meeting is closed.